Did Intel nerf the i7 with the launch of the 9700K? That's what I want to get to the bottom of in today's video. For those of you who might have missed this over Intel's 9th gen desktop CPU launch, Intel have completely removed hyper-threading from the Core i7 mainstream desktop CPUs and have instead decided to give it an additional two cores. Today we're going to find out what this means for gaming and production workloads and to ultimately conclude whether the 9700K is actually a better buy over the last gen 8700K. So that's the big topic of discussion for today. The 9700K has less total threads overall over the 8700K, but it does have a slightly higher uh, all core turbo boost clock and a max turbo boost clock over the 8700K and an additional two cores. It's also $40 more expensive, so you've got to consider that as well if it's not in your budget. And we will be comparing these two to the Ryzen 2700X and the Ryzen 2600. These CPUs need no introduction. In fact, the Ryzen 2700X is just $289 US at the moment, which I find absolutely incredible for you know an eight core desktop CPU. So it'll be very interesting to see not only how the Ryzen CPUs fare up in terms of overall performance, but overall on value as well. All right, so let's just dive right in. Most of you guys are pretty familiar with the test system and methodology at this point, as well as these CPUs. So let's start off with production workload benchmarks, starting off with rendering. Traditionally, that means Cinebench R15, since this is the mother of all CPU benchmarks. And here the 9700K is actually beating the 8700K at stock. That's fair enough, given that the 9700K can boost a bit higher. When they're both overclocked to five gigahertz though, we get the comparison that we really want to see. And that's that for clock for clock under the same architecture, the 9700K is beating the 8700K in raw rendering performance, even if it is just by a few points. Of course, for CPU rendering workloads, we know the Ryzen 7 chips need no introduction in these benchmarks. They are the best bang for the buck at this point. Now, restricting the render to a single thread shows that the 9700K is on top again, but the CPUs are effectively the same with this test at the same frequencies. Not many useful workloads are only single threaded these days, but this might give us some insight into gaming performance later on. On to Blender now, and here we're looking at how long it takes to render out the classroom scene in 1080p. Here we can expect similar results to what we saw in Cinebench R15, but here the gap widens between the two i7s. So at least for CPU rendering performance, it seems that eight cores and eight threads are superior to six cores and 12 threads when the architecture and clock speed is the same. In file compression, we see the opposite though with the extra threads on the 8700K now giving it a slight lead over the new i7. When both CPUs are overclocked to five gigahertz, we see the 8700K roughly 2.5% faster than the new 9700K. In decompression though, Ryzen truly is king, taking the lead by a long shot. And here it's actually the 9700K that was faster than the 8700K with the high total core count giving it the edge. Onto some content creation benchmarks now, and here we're looking at how fast these CPUs can export a 10 minute 4K video project containing color grading and effect layers. CUDA acceleration has been enabled here with a 2080 Ti. And keep in mind that by using the YouTube 4K H.264 encoding preset, the integrated GPU on the Intel CPUs is leveraged for an additional boost in encoding performance. In other words, it's enabled by default, and no, Intel did not pay me to manually select it. Out of the box though, the 9700K is a little over 7% faster than the 8700K, seeing as Premiere Pro doesn't really care about hyper-threading as we've seen before, but once the two CPUs are overclocked to five gigahertz, there's not a meaningful gap between them. In reality, some would argue that there's not a meaningful difference between any of the CPUs on the chart here, because after hours or days of work on a single video project, most people don't mind waiting for an extra few minutes. Onto Warp Stabilizer now, which is a video stabilization effect in Premiere Pro. And here we're seeing just how fast each CPU can stabilize four 10 second 4K clips. Seeing as this is mostly a clock speed dependent task, the faster clocked processors are going to take the lead. And out of the box, the 9700K is slightly faster than the 8700K. Also keep in mind that since the 9700K and 2700X are the only eight core CPUs in this benchmark, they usually had lower CPU usage across all of the video stabilization. It allows them to stabilize a larger number of clips at any one time. Okay, now let's move on to gaming and let's start with the most CPU intensive game tested in this lineup and that's Project Cars 2. 
This game utilizes the AVX instruction set and therefore performance is extremely dependent on the CPU. And this is the biggest gap today that you'll see between the 9700K and the 8700K. Although probably not perceivable, the 9700K has about an 8% boost over the 8700K out of the box and maintains roughly a 6.5% lead when both CPUs overclock to 5 gigahertz. Clock speed becomes the bottleneck here when we start reaching these higher frame rates in CPU intensive titles, but the gap between the Ryzen and Intel CPUs does close quite a bit at 1440p, despite operating at a reasonably high 144 FPS, give or take. Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p pushes the highest frame rate in our CPU testing suite, but overall is nowhere near as CPU intensive as Project Cars 2, and here the 8700K and 9700K are virtually the same with an average of around 280. 80 FPS. Since this game isn't too CPU intensive, the 2700X can actually boost above 4.2 GHz, yielding a superior result at stock. 1440p yields pretty much an identical playing experience for any CPU here in the stack. Even the Ryzen 2600 at stock can keep up with the more expensive desktop CPUs. We're seeing a similar result in For Honor at 1080p, where all of the Intel CPUs are pretty much the same, with the Ryzen CPUs within a reasonable gap, and then at 1440p, they're all virtually equal at average FPS, with the 8700K and 9700K just providing faster 1% and 0.1% frame rate. Shadow of the Tomb Raider seemed to really like the extra clock speed on the Intel CPUs, especially at this high of a frame rate, with the 9700K on average a bit faster than the 8700K. The Ryzen CPUs essentially hit a wall in this game at around 115 FPS, yielding almost the same result at 1440p. And in some cases, there is still a significant, although not perceivable gap between the two when they're both overclocked to 5 gigahertz. And I think that's a good note to close this video on. The 9700K is faster than the 8700K, but not perceivably faster in most applications. This is because the 8700K was already a very fast CPU, especially in gaming. And that goes for both gaming and production workloads. And I think it's fair to say that if the 9700K and 8700K are the same price in your region, then go for the 9700K. It is the fastest CPU. So if it is in your budget, then maybe. Maybe if you have a 240 hertz gaming monitor and you game at 1080p and you play CPU intensive titles and you know you wanna get the most out of your monitor, then I can see possibly leaning towards the 9700K and paying that slight uh, premium for it. But otherwise, the perceivable difference is just not there uh, between previous gen. And to answer the title of this video, no, Intel did not nerf the 9700K, despite um, a lot of people thinking that they did because they did cut hyperthreading, and that was a big difference between the i5 and the i7. But they've managed to save themselves here with the 9700K by adding those additional two cores and the 400 megahertz clock speed bump. So technically they did nerf it in terms of total threads. So there might be like 5% of workloads that you will see more performance on the 8700K, but in the majority of workloads, you will see the 9700K perform better. Uh, so I'd love to know what you guys think. So let me know your comments down below. Personally, I'm really hesitant to call this an i7 because we're not getting that hyperthreading support. And that was a big thing that separated the previous i5 and i7 CPUs. And we're just used to that sort of segmentation. Uh, but now things are getting really weird and we've got the i9 CPU, which you know, you're forced to buy that now if you want hyperthreading and it's getting all a bit weird. Anyway, guys, huge thanks for watching. Subscribe down below if you haven't already and I'll see you all in the next one.